occasionally I feel it necessary <clears throat> to talk with my people for a little while with sort of a fatherly exhortation along the subject about which I'm going to speak this morning. <clears throat> I holler so loud against sin, <clears throat> stomp my feet so hard, cry so much, and fight it so much. I guess it would be easy for you to get the idea that I have a few pet peeves and a few things that I just especially hate. That I don't want you to do what I don't want you to do. But for 28 years of pastoring and 30 years of preaching, I've seen people come back from sin. I've never seen any come, anybody come back laughing. I've seen them laugh while they were there, but never seen them laugh on the way back. Thirty years, I've been welcoming folks back to the arms of God. They never look as good as they did when they left. They never sparkle as much as they did when they left. They never smiled as much as they did when they left. Believe me when I say this. When I preach against sin, I have no desire for you to conform to my own whims and fancies. I want you to be happy. I hurt when you hurt. I hurt this morning for John Penley. And I weep when you weep. And I cry when you cry. And I feel bad when you feel bad. So this morning I want to chat with you for a while on the long-suffering God. I'm going to give the sermon a title that has to do with the last little story I'll tell you after a while, and I'm going to call the sermon, I'm Ready Now. Basically it deals with the patience and long-suffering of God. This week I read once again the Bible. Well, I think it's one of the sweetest statements in all the Bible, and it's very unusual that, that it would be considered sweet. It says, The word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amidiah, the second time, saying, And I just rejoiced again that God comes the second time. Aren't you glad God gave you another chance? God wanted to save you. <clears throat> you wouldn't trust him. Aren't you glad he gave you another chance? God wanted you to give your whole life to him and and come out from among the world in a separate and you wouldn't do it at first. Aren't you glad he gave you another chance? God called you to serve him as a preacher and you would not surrender the first time. Aren't you glad he gave you another chance? I used to preach a sermon years ago on the God of the second chance. And all the people in the Bible I'd list to whom God spoke the first time, they did not respond nor hear nor, nor answer and uh, God gave them the second chance. <clears throat> this week I've been rejoicing about the long-suffering of God. I'm glad God puts up with us. And I've been reliving my own life and my own ministry and counting some of the failures, reliving some of the mistakes that I've made. Oh, good night. <clears throat> it was a while some young preacher said, Dr. House, God has given you the gift of wisdom. No, <laughs> I doubt that. I've just made so many blundering fool mistakes. I've learned what not to do through the years, that's all. And uh, a young preacher's come to me and, and uh, they make mistakes, <coughs> make mistakes and, and I remember how I made them myself. And I've, I've been rejoicing this week about God's patience and God's long suffering and the fact that God is slow to anger. And uh, maybe God looks down and sees that little touch of sincerity in us and the Lord says, I believe the old boy is sincere, sort of a nut. I believe he's sincere, and he's sort of a screwball, but I think he means well. And the Lord sort of puts his tongue in his cheek and laugh, chuckles at us. You don't think the Lord has a sense of humor. Uh, why do he make such people like Fisk and others? Uh, <clears throat> and so uh, the dear Lord looks down and says, well, I'll give him another chance. And uh, he does it. God is so patient and long-suffering. I was thinking how that he waited 120 years. 
before he punished the people with the flood. Now think about that. 120 years. That's five eighths of the no no. Uh, let's see, five, uh, quite a bit. It's uh, it's six tenths, three fifths of the life of America. America's 200 years old as a nation. God waited 120 years before He sent the flood. Why? God didn't want to send the flood. How many of you parents have had to spank a child and you knew you had to punish him and you didn't want to? You knew you ought to. You knew you had to sooner or later. And you went, you know, maybe alone and cried for a while and then came back and spanked the child. I used to think my mother didn't mean it when she said, it hurts me worse than it hurts you. I thought she was a big liar. Still think she's lying a little bit. But uh, <clears throat> because, uh, well, I know one thing. If it hurt her worse than it hurt me, it did sure hurt her because I still can feel how it hurt me. But I know now. I know now. I recall the first time I ever placed a hand in spanking one of the children. I recall the lonely feeling. And uh, I recall time and time again when I've known I had to come and spank you. And I, I knew, I knew I had to do it. And I knew I had to take my church and, and take you over the coals for a while. I knew you needed it. I knew I had to do it. But I recall not wanting to do it. I don't know whether it's lonelier before you do it or after you do it, but it's lonely both times. And God's that way. Oh, God does send His wrath, but God doesn't want to. God does sometimes cause the clanging of steel and the squeaking of the brakes and the burning of the rubber and the spilling of the blood. God sometimes does cause it, but God doesn't want to. God doesn't want to. God's not a big God up in heaven that's got a bit of club in his hand and hoping that you will live in sin so he can spank somebody else. No, oh, God loves you. And God doesn't want to spank you. And God wants to sends you good instead of bad, and God wants you to smile instead of cry, and God wants to feed you instead of make you go hungry, and God wants to keep you well instead of putting you in the hospital, and God wants your baby to live instead of die. God's long-suffering, and he's so patient. Um, I was reading this week about the church of the Odyssea, that wicked church that pleased the people church, neither hot nor cold, the Odyssea. <clears throat> and yet our Lord said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's outside the door of the church at Odyssey, and I stand at the door and knock. He walks into that church. And if you'll check the Greek, you'll find it means, Behold, I'm taking my stand at the door and knocking. Or better still, I'm standing and standing and standing and standing. God says, I'm going to knock. I'm going to knock. I'm going to knock. I want in. I know you don't want me in, but I'm still going to knock. I was down in Dallas the other day preaching uh, for the Throw the Lord National Convention, and on Sunday night, 8,000 people were there from all over America, and I was burdened, and I was in my, in my room, and I prayed a while and studied a while, then I decided I'd take a bath. And so while I was bathing, <coughs> little hands knocked on the door. Like that. And I can tell little First Baptist Church knuckles anywhere in the world, because they knock on the door in my study time and time again. Well, there I was. I was in the bathtub. I want to take a bath once a week, whether I need it or not, and I, I, uh, <clears throat> and I couldn't go to the door, and then knocked again. And uh, so I got out of the bathtub, and I uh, didn't wash my ears too well, and just uh, sort of dried the dirt off my feet, and uh, they kept on knocking, and they kept on knocking. And ten minutes they knocked, and fifteen minutes they knocked. And finally, I was out of the bathtub, and I was, I was half-dressed, and I uh, forget which half, but I was half-dressed. And uh, they kept on knocking, and kept on knocking, and kept on knocking. And so, uh, finally, after 20 minutes, I mean, they'd rattle the door. I mean, then they'd rattle the doorknob. Then they'd get both hands. Then, then two boys with each hand would knock on the door. And they'd take their fist and do it like that for a while, for 20 minutes. And finally, I opened the door. <laughs> And I told them I'd been taking a bath. And it was two little boys in First Baptist Church. Their parents were in Dallas. One of them had a newspaper in his hand to give me, and the other had an orange to give me. And I said, thank you, fellas. And then, as I turned to walk away, one of them said, And Brother Hiles? And Brother Hiles? 
And I said, what is it, son? And he said, timidly, with his eyes filled with tears and his lips buckling, I love you. And I said, I love you too. And uh, he, they knocked and knocked, and I thought, it's worth ever, ever, <laughs> ever frazzling moment of the misery. And there's nothing worse than if I'm knocking on the door and you can't go to the door. And, uh, but uh, our Lord says, that's the way I am. I won't, I'm, I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking. I know it's a wicked church. But the Lord said, I want in. I'm not going to leave yet. I know you're just trying to please the people. But the Lord said, I want in. I, I don't want to go yet. I know you need a hot and a cold. But I want in. I don't want to go yet. And that God's so patient and so long-suffering. Aren't you glad? Some of you folks waited 20 years before you got saved. Aren't you glad he waited? Aren't you glad he kept on knocking? Aren't you glad he didn't leave? I was thinking this psalm, Psalm 81, 13. The Lord's talking about his own people and who left him and he had to put in the wilderness for 40 years. And one verse he said, <clears throat> I, uh, I gave them up. I gave them up because they wouldn't hearken unto me. And the next verse after he says, I gave them up, he says, Oh, that my people had hearkened unto me. Oh, when the Lord comes down and takes that little baby out of your home because you wouldn't serve him, the Lord comes down and leaves that little bronzed shoe on the mantel and that little empty place at the table and that little empty place in the high chair and that little plate pen that's no longer used. When God does that, God in heaven doesn't say, I'll get you, I'll teach you. you ought to say, no, God doesn't do it that way. God said, I didn't want to do that. But I just want you to myself, and I know it's better for you if you serve me. I know you're not going to be happy, and you may raise that little baby to go to the devil anyhow. And oh, that my people had hearkened unto me. I was thinking of Hosea. There's a scripture in Hosea, one of the sweetest in all the Bible to me. In Hosea 4.17, it's a sharp scripture. It says, Ephraim is joined to his idols. Let him on. The Lord looked down and said, Ephraim, I want you for myself. And Ephraim said, No. And the Lord said, Ephraim, come to me. And Ephraim said, No. Ephraim was one of the tribes of Israel. And the Lord said, Ephraim, I love you. Come to me. And Ephraim said, No. And finally God said, Okay, okay, Ephraim. Ephraim is joined to his idols. Let him alone. That's in chapter 4, verse 17. But in chapter 8, <coughs> 11 and verse 8, there's a sweet passage. It says, O oh, Ephraim, how can I give thee up? How shall I give thee up? How? The Lord has said a while ago, I, I'm going to give you up. But he changed his mind. He said, I can't give you up. I can't give it. O oh, Ephraim, how shall I give thee up? O oh, Ephraim. And if you'll check it there, the Lord likens Ephraim to a little baby. And he says, Ephraim, I taught you how to walk. The Lord said, Ephraim, I remember when you were a little baby and you couldn't walk. And I recall that first step. Ephraim, how can I give you up now that you've grown up and gone into sin? How can I give you up? And Ephraim, I fed you for the first time. Um, every mom and dad in this room knows what I'm talking about now. How could you give up on your daughter or your son? There are a dozen mothers in this room this morning whose hearts are breaking right in two. And there are a dozen fathers in this room, at least a dozen this morning, who do not feel like the sun will ever shine again. Why? Because the child, her child is gone into awful sin. Oh, this week they called me and they said, one of your young couples has run off, run off, and a couple, uh, not, and a couple of your kids, and they're in Decatur, Alabama. And I've been their pastor for these years. But the mothers say, I won't give them up. Mothers have, have put their heads on my desk in my study. And they've said, Brother Hiles, I can't give them up. I can't give them up. I can't do it. And listen, you check every mom and dad in this room this morning who has a daughter in sin or a son in sin. And like a chorus, they'll say, I know God's going to bring him back one of these days. I know God's going to bring her back. Uh, it's hard to give up someone you love that much. Huh. I remember, remember when she was born, and uh, and remember what she said. The first word she said, huh? You men know what the first word the baby said was? It was dad, dad. You ladies, God bless you. You can't hear very well. You thought it was mama, but it wasn't. It was dad, dad, just as plain as could be. And you recall that first little step, maybe, when uh, you said it was a step. Actually, they just fell across the room. That's all. And you said it was a step. And, uh, and Mary, you got that, uh, that, that movie camera and took that movie camera. Little dumb thing, boy. 
<coughs> and uh, remember when he said, bye-bye, bye-bye, while they squeeze out, bye-bye. And every time anybody came, you wanted them to hear, as if it's the first baby that ever said bye-bye. And, uh, and uh, uh, Becky and Tim um, uh, have one now that's uh, almost, and she's saying bye-bye, bye-bye. And you'd think it is the greatest accomplishment in the history of the world. Well, I happen to be the grandfather. It's a pretty big compliment, all right. And no, no baby ever quite said bye-bye, quite like she says it, of course. And uh, bye-bye. And God said, that's the way I feel towards you, Ephraim. How can I give you up? How can I give you up? And, uh, oh, and the Lord said, if Ephraim, I fed you when you were a little thing. I fed you. Anybody that's ever fed a baby knows what that is. <coughs> yeah. Uh, that's what we have nurseries for. So show, the, show them the nursery real quick, like if you would, please. And they talk about them, and they, they begin to cry. But uh, anybody that's ever fed a baby? Well, Dave loves to tell one of his sermons. He tells across the country how he's a little boy. We're sitting at the table, and he wouldn't eat his green beans. <coughs> and so I said, son, uh, eat your green beans. He said, no. Now, I don't care if you're a little boy, a little girl, or a deacon. You don't say no to me. <laughs> no. <coughs> deacon, deacon, when I tell you to eat green beans, you eat your green beans. <coughs> and so... <laughs> he said, no. And I said, eat your green beans. No. No. Oh. I didn't teach him that word. He'd been playing with some deacon's kids, and he learned that word. And so I said, eat your green beans. And Dave loves to tell this in his sermons. He said, no. So I took up a little spoonful of green beans. You might have a hit bobbles, you know, like that. And you try to hit the thing, and in it goes, and then right back out. You scrape it off like that, right back out. And you get about a tithe in every time you put it in, you know, and nine tithes come back out. And uh, I said, now, son, you listen to me. <clears throat> you're going to sit there and you're grown if you don't eat those green beans. By the way, he'd still be sitting there if he hadn't eaten them. He sat there two hours. And the way he tells it is a little bit of exaggeration. He says that, that I so impressed upon him the, in fact, he had any green beans. So he got all the green beans in the house and ate all the green beans and then went next door and asked them if they had any green beans. They could feed him. And, <coughs> but now, <coughs> and, and the Lord said, I fed you when you were a little thing and I saw your head bobble and I tried to keep the food in your mouth. And the Lord said, Ephraim, I love you and I can't get it. First he said, Ephraim is going to his idol. Holy Spirit, let him alone. But the Lord said, no, Holy Spirit, go back to him. Go back to him. I didn't mean it. I love him, and I don't want you to, to forsake him. And the Lord this morning walks up and down the pews and aisles of this building. And the Lord said, I want you. God wants you. I don't know why, but God wants you. I don't understand it, but God loves you. I don't know why, but God wants you more than anything in all the world. He wants you to love him. He wants you to serve him. He wants you to please him. He wants you to know Him. He wants you to fellowship with Him. And if you don't come to Him, the Lord is long-suffering and patient. In Numbers 14, 27, He said, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation? And then six times in the Bible you find the term, The Lord is slow to anger. Nehemiah 9, 17, Joel 2, 13, Psalm 103, verse 8, Jonah chapter 4, verse 2, Psalm 145, 8, Nahum chapter 1 and verse 3, The Lord is slow to anger. Slow to anger. And he is. And he is. And the Lord says this morning, I want you. If you've gone in the depth of sin, God still wants you. He says, come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be like as wool. God wants you this morning. What you say, Brother Howard, is you don't understand. I've been in the depths of sin. But God says, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. But you say for the house. One man stood out in the alley one night. I talked to him about the Lord. And he said, you don't understand. He said, these hands have killed a man. And I've been in the penitentiary for murder. And I said, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. But you say for the house. I've been a prostitute. I've been in the red light district and have sold my body to the wicked hands of evil men. But though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. God wants you. God, but you deserve the house. I'm going to wait till I get the, I get the, uh, better. No, God wants you like you are. Uh, one time, Charlotte Elliott, a lady, 
was uh, in church, and the preacher said, come to Christ. And she came down the aisle, and the pre- she said, how do you come to Christ? He tried to tell her, and she didn't understand. And, and, and he said, you come. And she said, how do you come to Christ? And he said, uh, and they, all of a sudden he shouted, come just as you are. And she did, and she got saved, and she wrote that song, Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Just as I am, though wretched, blind, sight riches, healing of the mind. Yea, all I need in thee to find. O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Just as I am, though tossed about with many a conflict, many a doubt, fightings and fears within, without. O Lamb of God, I come. I've heard read Spurgeon so many times who said, Come to Jesus! <clears throat> you can't come to Jesus! He said, You can't run to Jesus! If you can't run, walk to Jesus! If you can't walk, crawl to Jesus! If you can't crawl, look to Jesus. There's life for a look at the Savior. And God wants you this morning. And let me say this too. Now listen to me. I don't care who you are. I don't care how much fun you say you're having in sin, you know it's not satisfying. You know it. As well admit it. Confess it. Oh, I had a big time last night. You know better than that. You know better than that. I went out and took some dope last night. What a time. Yeah, what a time of misery. There is not a sinner in this room this morning. But what would not admit if it, it would know if you would admit it and say it if you'd be honest? Doesn't make you happy. No, it doesn't make you happy. Never has. Would God, you people that are on your way towards it, would listen to those who are on the way home? Would God, you people that have not yet tasted it, would believe those that have tasted it and find how awful and bitter the taste of sin is? God loves you this morning. Hey, bus kids, God loves you. Little child, maybe your dad's out drunk all night last night. Maybe your mama doesn't ever say, I love you, but God loves you. Hey, kids, God loves you this morning. Maybe the, maybe you live in the ghetto of Chicago in your front yard. You have to share it with 50 other kids. Maybe it's a, simply a concrete sidewalk. And maybe there's no distance between the house next door and your house. And, and maybe all you do is live in some ghetto. But God loves you and God has a home prepared for you if you'll trust His dear Son. God loves you. Hey, man, go on the bottom of sin. Your life has been tainted with sin and you've tasted the dregs. Of the cup of Satan, God loves you. Hey, rescue mission man, God loves you this morning. You fellows that stumbled into mission and uh, and uh, life has seemed like it was ended and your children won't even speak to you and your home is gone. God loves you this morning. Hey, pathfinders, educable, slow people. Now maybe, maybe you don't go to the school with the rest of us, but God loves you this morning. Thank God he loves you. Hey, deaf people, you can't hear like others, but God loves you this morning. Hey, ladies, God loves you. Hey, sinner! Hey, drunkard! Hey, harlot! Hey, prostitute! Hey, homosexual! God loves you! I know no greater news than that. He's a long-suffering, patient God whose arms and invitation are extended toward you today. And God uses every possible way to get you to come to himself. He tries peace. If that won't work, he tries war. He tries plenty. If that won't work, he tries famine. <clears throat> but now, wait a minute. There comes a time when God's anger comes. He's slow to anger, but he does get angry. He is patient, but he does sooner or later get impatient. He is long-suffering, but someday he gets to place to where he says, I've got to do something. And so the Lord sometimes will say to his people, don't, have, don't be burdened for them anymore. Don't pray for them anymore. Try somebody else. I said to a young man, listen to me. I said to a young man last last week in my office, I think it was Friday night late, or I grew up in this church. He loves me, and I love him. I I pastored him when he was that just, just a, a little kid, and now he's almost 30 years of age. And I'm sure he's here this morning, and I love him very much. But I told him, I called his name, and I said to him, I've done all I can do for you. You come to church, but you haven't given all to God. I mean, you, you still play around in the world. 
<clears throat> I said, I've, I've done all I can do for you. I've shot all the ammunition. I feel like a fella who's taken his gun and shot it at, a, on, uh, at an approaching uh, uh, animal, trying to kill him, and the last bullet's been shot, and the animal still comes forward. I've done all I can do for you. Now listen, if you won't listen to the preacher when he tries to help you, then God's got to take some drastic measures. Now what does God do when that happens? I know what God does. And I told him, here's what God will do. Uh, one day, one night you go to bed, and you wake up in the wee hours of the morning, and you hear a faint cry from the crib in the other room. And you go to the other room, and you feel the brow, and it's fevered. Oh, it's burning with fever. And maybe you get some alcohol, and maybe you rub alcohol on the body. Or maybe you get some co a cold rag, and rub a cold rag on the body. And you give an aspirin to try to cut the fever. The fever doesn't cut. And the baby's breathing sort of heavy. And uh, then, then you, heavily, and you take the baby to the hospital, the doctor, and the doctor puts the baby in the hospital. And uh, I've been there, and if you have, and you walk and pace the floor, and you wonder, oh, God, what is it? What is it? What is it? And finally the doctor comes out and says she's gone. And then there's a little casket about that long lady. And there are the tears. And there's the bronze little shoe up on the hearth on the mantel. And there's the empty crib of the empty bed. Many of you know what I'm talking about. Ladies and gentlemen, God doesn't want to do that, but God's going to have to if he can't get you to come to him. God doesn't want... God wants you to have a healthy baby. And God wants you to have a happy baby. And God wants you to serve Him. But let me tell you something. If God has to take your baby, God will do it to get you to serve Him. I... Uh, maybe... Maybe it'll be that you won't feel well. And maybe it'll be that you haven't served. And the preacher said, Serve Him! And the preacher said, Come to Him! And your mom and dad prayed for you, maybe... Or maybe one day, all of a sudden, you don't feel well. And you go to the doctor, and you have tests, and you call the pastor study and say, pray for the test, that they'll be negative. But you go back to the doctor, and the doctor says, you've got cancer. Or you've got to have open heart surgery. And then your mind wanders back to all the sermons where the house preached when I begged you to get right. And I begged you to serve God, and you wouldn't do it. And you kept your beer in your ass box, and you kept your dirty playboy magazines, and you kept your dirty stories, and you kept your filth, and you kept your filthy movies on television, and you kept your evil thinking, and you kept your evil dressing, and you wore your hair like a bunch of long-haired hippies, and uh, you wouldn't come to God. For the house wasn't trying to make you mad. For the house was making enemies so you could get right with God and so you could serve Him. But the Lord, you wouldn't listen. And the Lord, and all of a sudden, there you are. And you're not, well, God didn't want to do that. God didn't want to do that. You heard me tell this. When the Lord said, the psalmist said, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. You know what that meant? Here's a shepherd. <laughs> and the shepherd says, uh, uh, tries to lead a little sheep, and the sheep goes off. And the shepherd goes and gets the sheep and brings it back. And the sheep wanders off again. And the shepherd says, stay in this pasture. But the little lamb won't do it. You know what finally the shepherd would do? The shepherd would take the, a leg from that little lamb <coughs> and break the leg of the little lamb. Now what does the lamb do? The lamb can't run off anymore. The lamb stays in the green pastures. The shepherd had made the lamb lie down in green pastures. Now you listen to me, people. Every person in this room, listen to me. God didn't make you to wallow in a nightclub. God didn't make you to do what Mr. Ford does and put a picture in the paper and drink that dirty liquor and pick the shame. It's a shame or disgrace for our president to have his picture on the front page of a newspaper with a bottle of wine pouring it down his side. God didn't make you for that. And I don't care what Mrs. Ford said. God didn't make you for premarital sex either. And God didn't make you... <laughs> to live like animals, and God didn't make you to curse His name, and God didn't make you to stay home on Sunday night and watch a television program while God's man is preaching. God made you for fellowship with Himself. That's why God made you. And God hungers for fellowship with you. 
because he loves you. But if he can't get you to serve him with a compassionate, come unto me. He'll break your leg. He'll put you in a hospital. Maybe, maybe, a, maybe you won't serve him like you should. <clears throat> and a child about 13 years of age begins to rebel. You said, be home on time? She comes home late. Well, he comes home late. And after a while, ah, oh, Mom, come on, you're too strict on me. Come on, Dad, you're too strict on me. And you see that first little seed of rebellion coming in that child. And then maybe she slips out. And maybe she goes out the window and at night and gets with the wrong crowd. And then one day, horror of horrors, you find it out. You never dreamed. If you've been right with God, you dream. But you never dreamed that suddenly you find out she's been smoking marijuana. And the whole world is pulled out from under you. And that little baby girl that you carried in your own body. You remember those days? You ladies remember? Remember? Your husband came home one night and you were knitting. And he, you said, I went to the doctor today. And he said, uh, oh, you got the flu? He said, yes, I got the nine-month flu. He said, you, 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 yeah, that's right, that's right. And you ladies remember, you started getting bigger and bigger and bigger. When you laid on your back, you looked like a pyramid in Giza. And you got on your stomach, you looked like a rocker on a rocking chair. And you ate pickles for breakfast and watermelons at 2 o'clock in the morning. And, you, and your face got sort of uh, uh, funny looking. It was fun looking already, probably, but got sort of funnier looking. And... Uh, and you and you, you you regurgitated that's the Greek word for vomit and and regurgitated every morning and you felt sick at your stomach and 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 uh, then one night two o'clock in the morning every baby is born at two o'clock in the morning not a baby has ever been born in daylight and two o'clock in the morning <clears throat> reached over to your husband and you said uh, the pains are getting pretty close he said don't you worry everything's going to be all right. <laughs> you said, thank you for your calm con consolation. And so uh, he, you told him where the suitcase was, and, and he went and got the garbage can instead. <clears throat> so you got the suitcase and took it out to the car. And he took off to the hospital and going about 90 miles for an hour in a 30-mile zone, looked up in the rearview mirror and saw a bubble going around and around, pulled over the side of the road, and the policeman said, hey, where are you going, to a fire? And, and your husband said, no, 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 no. It's my hospital here. She's going to the baby to have a wife. Oh, no, 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 no. It's my baby here. She's going to the wife to have a hospital. <laughs> and the, the, the policeman was a very kind man. He said, I understand. You follow me. And he followed you. And they rolled you through a room, into a room, through a door. And you suffered like nobody ever suffers. And then soon there was a cry and a tug at your breast. To me, there's something awful sad about that, for you not to rear him, right? Something awful sad about that little thing to break your heart some day, smoking marijuana. Something awful sad about that. But one of these days, the Lord said, I want you to serve me. And you said, no, Lord, I won't serve you. But I want you to serve me. Okay, Lord, I'll go on Sunday morning, but I'm not going to be a fool about it. I know. I like to hear Hiles preach every once in a while, but, but he's sort of a nut. No, no, I'm a nut. If being against marijuana is a nut, I'm a nut. If hating liquor is a nut, I'm a nut. If believing in decency is a nut, I'm a nut. If hating communism makes you a nut, I'm a nut. If believing you ought to serve God 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 12 months a year, 52 weeks a year, 24 hours a day, 60 minutes an hour, 60 seconds a minute, if that makes you a nut, I'm a nut. But, uh, you see, I wouldn't want to... I wouldn't want to go to see. I wouldn't want to be a fanatic. But the Lord says, I want you to be a fanatic. I want you to love me all the time. I want you to serve me. I want you to have a bus route. I want you to go soul winning. <laughs> Lord, <laughs> Lord, I go to church every Sunday morning. But I want you to go back on Sunday night and Wednesday night. <laughs> Lord, I give a dollar. Sometimes two dollars if I, if I work overtime. But I want you to give a tithe and offerings to me. But Lord, you know, I mean, I don't cuss. But I don't want you to watch those dirty programs on television either. Well, Lord, you know I don't, I don't get drunk. I don't want you sipping your martinis either. And one day the Lord will come down. 
and do what to you what he did to a man in Texas. God came to one of my young men in Texas and said, I want you to preach. I want you to preach. The young man came to me and said, Pastor, God's called me to preach, and I know it. But I'm not ready to preach. I'm not ready to preach. And so I said, but you ought to get ready. Do God's will. That's the only safe place in the whole world, the only happy place in the world. And he said, I'm not ready. I've got a good job. I'm not ready. And he'd come down the aisle often and say, well, the house, I know God's called me to preach, but I'm just not ready. I'm not ready yet. And into the home came a sweet little baby girl. And one day, the word came that the baby girl was rushed to the hospital, dehydrated. <coughs> they called me from the hospital and said she was dead. We went to a funeral home downtown Garland, Texas. And the ho- all the people came by and viewed the remains of the little baby. And the last two people that came, of course, were the parents. And the father came by and threw his head on my shoulder and said, Preacher, I'm ready now. I'm ready now. And I'm glad he was. But if you get ready before that happens, it won't have to happen. The Lord loves you this morning. He wants you to serve him. He knows what's best for you. He knows. He knows. His power can make you what you ought to be. His love can fill your soul and you will see it was best for him to have his way. And that's why I mean, and that's why I holler and storm. And that's why I beat the pulpit. Because I've seen too many people go the way you're going. The road, <coughs> listen, the road to rock music is a lot of fun. The road back is a pretty pretty rocky, thorny road. The road to loose morals is mighty, mighty beautiful. The road home is awful sad. This mini-skirted, short-wearing, paint-wearing, loud-mouthed, rock music generation has a lot of fun on the way. Ask Patty Hurst how the trip is back. Ask Marilyn Monroe how the trip is back. Ask Elizabeth Taylor how the trip is back. I was reading a magazine one day, one of these little folding magazines inside the newspaper, you know, on Sunday. It was a story of Elizabeth Taylor. And Elizabeth Taylor was telling about her life. And she said in the story, she said, I'll tell you, I just have not found happiness in all of, with all my wealth. So I suggested that we should give it to me. And let me see if I can find happiness with it. But uh, I have not found happiness with all my wealth. And she said Michael Todd, and she said Eddie Fisher, and she said, Richard Burton, and she said, everybody, I guess, the Fisk, and she doesn't care for him. And uh, so she's had them all. And down at the bottom, she made this statement. She said, do you know what? Sometimes I wish I could just go back over and start all over again and get born again. And I picked up the paper and I said, Liz, old gal, that's exactly what you need. It's exactly what you need. Yeah, we're a strange bunch of people. Down at First Baptist. Strange bunch of people. Bible totem. Soul winning. And all of that. Give 10% of income to that preacher. Takes 24 men to carry off all the money he makes every week. For any bunch of people. But you'll love me forever. You'll love me forever if you'll le- believe me and follow what's preached from this pulpit. When the dear Lord says, How can I give you up? Won't you try it? 
You know what you got now is not working. Won't you try it? Huh? Won't you try it? Let us pray.